So welcome to the LJFA webinar tonight, everyone, um, and welcome to the, the next edition of the LJFA Winter Webinar Series. Tonight's topic we're looking at is how to be a coach on the sideline or how to be a coach on match day. So um, we, 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 I'll introduce my guest in, in a few minutes. Before that, we hope you, you, you're all safe and well and that you're going to uh, enjoy tonight. If you've missed any of our previous webinars uh, in relation to coach education, they're all available on our LJFA YouTube channel. So if you get a few moments over the coming days or months, you're more than welcome to, to look into those webinars. Tonight's webinar will be also recorded. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, our guest speaker tonight, and that's Lee Magan. Uh, I think the best description I've, I've seen of Lee Magan was he's a coach's coach. Um, he's a man that's been involved with coaches and players at all levels, whether it be a club, county, national, international where so he has a, a plethora and a wealth of experience and we're really looking forward to him to, to have you here tonight so liam is going to present for about i'd say 30 35 minutes if you have any questions please use the chat function i'll monitor that throughout and uh, at the end of the webinar we'll have a QA &A with liam so without further ado i'm going to pass you over to liam Morgan. off you go liam there it is. thank you very much william from from one william to another so th thank thank you very much isn't it? Thank, thank you to all the people who are out there, William tells me, nationally and internationally. Thank you for, for giving your time today. Uh, I welcome this opportunity to deliver, to share. I also genuinely welcome the challenge. Anytime you're asked to do something like this, you don't idly just wax up and, and, and go and present it. And while there might be some uncomfortable moments in finalizing things or planning, planning things, I do welcome the challenge to do it and we'd be delighted to have it done and so forth. I also feel it's the best alternative for now. It's a great acceptance now that we cannot do certain things, but I think it's a great demonstration of what coaches do. Coaches do stuff. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity now to, to, to review, to, to build up on information and knowledge and, and to hopefully share and discuss things further for, for yourselves. As an educator, I always thought that too much education was too socially distant. It's a phrase now that comes into, into a lot of parlance, but I didn't use it that way. But I never really agreed with the idea with the teacher or the coach or the tutor up at the top of the classroom and everybody else elsewhere listening. We, we need to get down and dirty. And that is the ideal, but in the absence of the ideal, we can certainly maximize the opportunities uh, to, to, to go and do the others, and, and, and I welcome that. I'd like also to begin with just a, a memory of, of, of Eamon Ryan. I was lucky to meet Eamon Ryan in the context of a course he did in Limerick and, and then remain friends with him ever since. And to say that he was a scholar and a gentleman is just boxing in something maybe too too unfairly but I love in the days since he has died there has been a balance between what he achieved and how he achieved it and I think that's a great reflection of, of Eamon a man who made the complex seem simple but he was humble he was modest and yet you could see that behind a very humble exterior, there, there was some great stuff going on there that he was more than willing to share with, with everybody. So it's just a, 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 a memory of, of, of Eamon. Eamon never had a high horse, but I want to get up on a high horse now to, to set a context of what I'm talking about here. And it's about coaching on the sideline during a match. Now, where is there a bias or some type of impartiality? And there is. My aim, my aim as a coach educator would be that coaches would get off the sideline and they would sit together and watch the players play the football match. Now, big changes since last year and the way we may wear masks and do various things. I'm hoping that day will come too. So, you know, so, some of what I say is, is geared towards steps towards that. So, so, so be willing to, to do that. Another thing I'd say at this point, I have practically made a living by using the phrase that telling doesn't work. And here I am, here I am, lean for all he's worth telling for half an hour, 40 minutes or whatever else. Now, I, I'll make a promise to try and balance that. 
I have notes either side of me here, little prompts. And in the next while, the next while, like the politicians promised by spring, they don't say when spring is, and I, I'm just leaving the same little bit of flexibility. In the next while, I, I'll write this up as an article about how to coach from the sideline. And I, I get it to William. And through that, we'll be able to put it up on an LGFA website. I have an excuse. I'm in a brace at the moment. I see patches are unforgiving things. And I had what they call on this in this house, uh, an old man's fall and, and, and whatever else. OK, so that, that's a bit of a windy introduction. My aim today in regarding this would be that you would do, do something differently. And uh, obviously that you do it in a, in a better and more effective way. That's my overall aim. While I haven't got the direct contact with you, again, my aim would be that by the end of this so session, the coaches will list. So automatically, you know, I'm going to get you just to draw right I would encourage you to, to take notes. Uh, I have five main points, uh, five main hubs with points hung around those and, and I'll share that with you. So I would invite you to list and then to plan, to apply your plan and to improve. And I suppose very much like the role that a coach has on the sideline, I have some influence over the fact that you will list. I, I am going to ask you to, to list. Uh, and I might be able to see some feedback on that in the chats. But I have a very distant influence on whether you plan or apply or indeed improve. But I hope I create a curiosity. I hope I create an environment where, where, where that will happen. So the overall aim that you do one thing differently and then list, plan, apply uh, and, and improve. I have through sharing company with many coaches in many different sports and at many levels, as William has said, being able to identify a cohort of coaches who are excellent in a training environment and maybe not as effective during a competitive match or game or race or whatever. And likewise, I can think of very effective coaches on game day in the heat of competition, the white heat of competition, who are not necessarily the best coaches in the training atmosphere. And of course, the aim in our role as coaches, our aim is to help players. Our aim then should be to, be able to prepare for competition and then perform in competition. So there's an onus on us to be able to be effective in our training role and effective in the competition role. Very, very different environments, different places, different settings, lack of control, and, you know, from, from what we have in our own pitch and so forth. So I, I, I want to make that point at, the, at, at that point. This is also like a coaching session. It's not really about what we do, but it's about how we learn. And we get obsessed as coaches often, what we do, what we do, where really it's about setting a climate, setting a climate where we can perform to our best as coaches, and so often we control the climate where players can maximize their performance. So I'm inviting you just to come back a wee bit and um, set that climate and be a bit selfish too in, the, in your thoughts and in your notes today. It's, it's about you. How can you, what can you get out of this to help you perform best in the white heat of competition on a sideline or at my wish of sitting back up with the other coach having it? as well as telling doesn't work, I've also set my flag out a lot that in planning any session, be it on a pitch or be it in a classroom, plan the outcomes, I share those with you already, list, plan, apply, improve. You decide your content and then you go ahead and the method that you go and deliver it can be, can be wide and varied. The content I have today will be hung around five hubs, as I mentioned, hubs. There's another term that I wouldn't have used last year. I want to hang it around the, the mnemonic maker, M-A-K-E-R. So that will be where a lot of the notes can come out of, if you like, maker, and, I, and I'll come up on that in a moment. But for a start, your first task, and I'll only give you a short 30 seconds or so to come up with it. I want you to imagine you're watching the players. What do you want to see the players doing? What 
and de describe it in an action verb. I'll start the ball rolling by saying you want them to pass, you want them to tackle, you want them to shoot. Now write down two or three other action verbs that you'd like to see the players doing there. I, I'll do in the veil for a few moments. You're going to put them in the, the chat function there. So we've, I just I, I give you what's coming in to move, to communicate, to make good decisions, to yeah. talk, to kick, um, yeah. to support, to be okay, composed. That, that, that's enough for now, William. And anybody else who comes in, we can, we can share that with them afterwards. But that's good. OK, so we've got that list. The other ones I had there, shoot, paths, kick, tackle, run and jump. Now, imagine there's somebody watching you as the coach and they're doing a list of what they see you as a coach doing. I'm going to say plan. I'm going to say observe. Now, again, feed us into the chats, write it down. Some other action verbs of what you see the coach doing, please. So in the chat, guys, what do you see the coach doing? So we have encourage, shout, <laughs> record, um, walking, uh, guiding, um, supporting, delegation. Um, there are just a few things, praising and helping. There's yeah. analyzing. There are a few things that are coming in and observing, Liam. There are a few things okay. that are coming in from the chat. All right. Now, there, there are words that match some of the ones I have myself as well. And I do also lean on some phrases. I've used that a few times. There some words, we use words when we have nothing else to say words. So some of these things like communicate, uh, moving, guiding, steering, motivating, that they, they can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. But the two lists, just the provisional ones I have there, the players shoot, pass, kick, tackle, run, jump. And the side for the coaches I had that they plan, they observe to see that the plan might be implemented. They analyze. Of course, coaches make selections, selection for substitutes, selections for the starting. And um, they motivate, and I might come back and just to describe a little bit more about that word later on. And most of all, coaches assimilate information. Now, in low-key club thing, it might be the assimilation you see yourself only. But in a high performance um, inter-county thing, there might be a whole flood of analysis coming to you that you've got to assimilate. So you can see from the two lists that there's a great difference between what the coach does and what the player does. And I think that will help us an awful lot now in, in moving on and how we coach from the sideline. So for the M of my maker, the M I'm going to use to say, Mind your own business and you'll be busy all the time. Now, some people of my generation will think, oh, that's a Hank Williams song. And indeed it is, the great Hank who died at 29 and look at the influence he left on music. Mind your own business and you'll be busy all the time. Now, that's a great start to coaching on the sideline because I would add to that that everything that happens away from your business is a distraction. It's something just taking you away from the fine analysis and observation of what you need to be doing. So mind your own business and you'll be busy all the time. There's enough to do. Second thing I'd say here is you're not a player. You can see now from the lists, what you're required to do is not what the players are required to do. Despite the fact you may have spent years playing and you may still be a player, the role you, you have now is that there's a different business to it. So you're not a player. And I would use the phrase, cop on to that. And the best game coaches are ones who realize, I, I'm not a player. There's a different job, there's a different role that I have to, have to do it here. In our role of working with players in this context, it's a lot different from the context in which we work with them at home and in training. They're on edge now. Players are always brittle. It's fragile what works and what doesn't work. Uh, there's an opponent here now. There's a consequence to what do it. So what, what happens? So people are on edge. Uh, they're unnerved. So our relationship with the people now at this point, it's a lot more fragile than it has been before. So that climate that we try to set up, the ideal kind, uh, climate for people to perform and to learn that certainly has been contaminated, if I was to use that. And there's two myths I'd like to say in this first point or what the maker as well, M for myths. 
There's the one that you have considerable power over the result. It's a myth. You're impotent, impotent in, in controlling the result of the game. The winning or the losing of the game is fully in the player's brief. Now, I think as you as coach realise that, and the other side of the line, it should be, it's in their brief, the winning or the losing. So that myth, get, get, get rid of it. We have some influence over their performance, but as regards the result, we're impotent on it. The other one is something that we bring from our training situation. The players learn best through carefully structured conditions controlled by someone like you who knows about what you're doing. So we, 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 we live the life as coaches in training. The players will learn best through carefully structured conditions controlled by you. A game isn't like that. Other than the start, half time and end, the structure can be wide and varied. And control, whew, control is, there's, there's 15 other players trying to take that control from you. The other reality, it's not a myth, is the players don't need coaches. They just need a football. Give them a ball, give them a space, they're off. So there's a reality here of what's my business. My business here, aim to be the best me that I can be. Now, anything else that comes into that is a distraction. Secondly, I'm not a player, cop on to that. Thirdly, the context in which I'm dealing with the players has changed enormously. So there'll be a role in managing the stresses and so forth. Okay, that, that, that's the M. The A is to accept what is. What is might suck at times. What is might not be too pretty. But accepting the conditions, the setting, the flow, the timing, the conditions of dressing room, of travel, they're only a small part of accepting what is. Look, in acceptance, you're going to score, they're going to score. You're going to get freeze, they're going to get freeze. Your influence, as I said earlier, is very, very minimal regarding your result, but your influence on yourself is mega. It's huge. And hence, the potential to influence the climate or the condition or the mental framework of the players is also huge. And so much for the players is already decided, you know. I like to think from the nature nurture thing. The nature is where they're from. It's the club environment. Uh, it's the context of the game. The nurture is more, well, you and the parents and their teachers, you have put things in place. And now for the game, we're going to measure under stress. What's this nature and nurture? What's, what's it going to look like? So we've got to make an, an acceptance of that, that they're already hot wired into what they're going to be doing. Athletics will be my main sport. You know, at the start of any marathon, the athletes that have put in the miles are the athletes who are most likely to get the results from them, you know. It's important in accepting that we acknowledge the unknown. I would see coaches lose or erode, erode, not lose, erode the trust the players have in them and diminish the confidence the players might have in them by, if I put it, pretending they know, I know you're going to play well today, Mary. I, I know the way they're going to set up against us. I, I know the way this player is going to do it. That's, that's a big fault because we don't know. And we've got to acknowledge that. It's part of what unnerves the player in the dressing room. They know they don't know. So if we come to try to alleviate this discomfort or this nervousness with them by saying, you know, unconsciously there's things going on in their head, you are talking rubbish, you, you, you don't know. So in accepting what we don't know is this acknowledgement, I think. And I do believe in the value of video analysis in its proper context, but in pretending you know, it's like seeing the video for next week lateral numbers rather than looking at the video of last week's lot of numbers. Completely and utterly different. So accepting what you don't know is important. Look, fate, timing, bingo, into the, into the ingredients. So that, that has to be accepted as well. And I love coaches who start from the beginning of not accepting mistakes. I, as a coach, the potential here is I'm going to make a mistake. The players are going to make a mistake. The officials, the referee will make a mistake. Accept it, let's, let's get on with it. Let's, let's, let's move on from there. 
there's a lovely phrase in a poem called Markings by Seamus Heaney, let go, let fly, forget you have listened long enough. The game is the time, the game is the time to forget, let's get into a, a, a mindfulness, let's get into a place where we can see what we have learned, how nature and nurture has, has, has uh, where, where it has got us, so the acceptance of mistakes. I like the idea of accepting that sometimes when you might make a bad decision, but it works out, it's seen as a, it's seen as a brilliant decision. Or sometimes you would weigh things up and make a correct decision, but it doesn't work out and it's seen as, as a bad decision. So accept that whatever you do, sometimes you're, you're going to lose out on it. And the example that comes to my mind, and I know now it's a little bit age, age set, but when Claire won the All-Ireland hurling with uh, Gerlach now the first time, there was a mistake on the sideline and they selected a guy, a sub to go in called Eamon Taff. Eamon Taff hadn't played in any of their championship games all year, but Eamon Taff, Taff ran in, 65 from Anthony Daly, hit the crossbar, came out, and Eamon Taff was there and he banged it into the goal. Meantime, on the sideline, they, regard, they realized their mistake and they took off Eamon Taff. That goal won the, won the odd Ireland for them. A mistake? Well thought out? I don't know. Joe Smith, rightly hailed as a great coach, did not pick Peter O'Mahony for the final time they played England in the Aviva. The captain, whose name from Kildare just misses me right now, but he got injured in the warm-up and Peter O'Mahony came in, got man of the match. So was Joe Smith right or wrong not to select him or to select him? And on the basis of that match, Warren Gatland selected Peter O'Mahony and made him captain of the Lions team for their first game on tour. He didn't play well and he didn't play for the rest of the tour. So was Warren Gatland right or wrong to select him? So the acceptance of what you do, you know, it, it's, it's a tough measure and, and I'm not going to say how it's measured, but you've got to get into the idea and accept Acknowledge, I don't know what it, what, what's happening, but acknowledge also that you may make decisions based on all the right evidence that you have regarding the player, the game, whether you're up, you're down. It may not work and you will be judged accordingly. Mind your own business and you'll be busy all the time. Accept what is and what is can suck from, from various times. K, K, know your role. What's my job? And again, getting back to that idea that I was saying, uh, about differences between training and, and, uh, and playing. Our job at all times as a coach is to help to accelerate, facilitate improvement in players. To facilitate means to make things easier. And as an addition to that is to raise their awareness, raise their awareness of what is. Players can be self-directed. And when players learn on the ground in the stressful situation of a game, Wow, we're handing them over a wonderful tool of learning at that point. A wonderful, wonderful tool. So know your role. It's to accelerate their learning. No better chance than a game to do that. Facilitate their learning. Get off the stage. Let, let, them, let them work on it. And help raise their own awareness of what a skill they might have thought they'd nailed in training. Maybe with slower, maybe with their friends marking them, maybe with more space, maybe with no consequence, maybe when they weren't as tired. Now they, their awareness is lifted. Players can self-direct. As a teacher, I, I'm very much opposed to assessment. Anyone who knows me would know that. But I would have to say that our schools and universities are geared a lot around assessment. So any wise student will, will cram because cram will get the information in that you've got to get out. However, that kind of cramming doesn't allow us to remember it in the long term, first of all, enjoy it, appreciate it, or apply it. So knowing our role, the stepping back idea is maximizing their opportunities to learn because us telling them, us shouting at them, us directing them, steering them, cajoling them, it's actually, it's a form of cramming and it's reducing that opportunity for them to really, really learn. So what is our role? Our role is to forensically plan what's ahead. Now, in order to get the best out of yourself and, and just leave yourself 
settled, you know, forensically plan what? Things like, I, I call them the four S's, your, your, your selection, your likely subs, the possible scenarios and the shape. So there are four S's. I, I think it's a forensic duty of coaches to have shared with the players, communicated with the players and with all the other coaching team that we there, the four S's, the selection, the subs, likely scenarios and the possible shapes. There's other more mundane but essential things, timetable, clear timetable, arrival, departure, da 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 da, da all the various things. The equipment, and I encourage players to have their own timetable when they, from the time they get up in the morning to their breakfast, to their departure from their house, to the arrival at the team meeting. Now that's when your timetable will take out. I encourage coaches and players to have separate lists of equipment. So the main player is not looking at their bag a few minutes before, oh God, I, I forgot my boots. That has a ripple effect of panic all over the place. So that idea of equipment and the various personnel that will be along with you and will not be along with you and the role. So that forensic planning, the four S's, selection, subs, scenarios, and shape, and then a more mundane type of thing, timetable, equipment, and, and um, personnel. You'll spend an enormous amount of time with the players as regards their position and their body language and their place on the field. Now, I think you as a coach need to give consideration big time to that also every day. What position will you take up? What place is the best place on the pitch for you in order to fulfill your role? And someone looking at your posture, at your body language, what, what messages are you informally throwing out there? So those three Ps are very important for your forensic planning there. And I'm not going to be issue a diktat in, in, in a real way in which this should be done because I think part of knowing your role is be true to you, true to your mojo, true to your personality, an extension of you from training. It's an extension of how people would expect you to behave. So in other words, there's, there's a consistency there. Yes, you can have your game face, all right but there's a consistency to the way you treat people and deal with people. You're in a sense of control all the time, you're not going to lose the head. You're not going to be allow the distractions interfere with your concentration on your game. You ooze the sense of confidence and enjoyment. One of the things I can remember about Eamon are these lovely photographs of a joyful Eamon on the sideline. Now, in many of those situations, he had reasons to be but there was a joyfulness he was oozing out of him at all times. And we have a responsibility in the midst of the chaos that the players are playing in. We're the ones that provide order from the chaos. The best players should never see us on the sideline. The best players in a situation should never depend on some words or seeing an action by the coach on the sideline. However, if they look to the sideline, they should see a calmness and a confidence in the way that they would expect to see from you anyway, so that you, they can see that you have been removed from the bedlam that they're facing. Not easy, I know it's not easy. So it's really a case of managing stress. You know, you have this optimum stress, the bell curve. It, it's not getting rid of stress. It's, it's, it's managing this stress. And of course the forensic planning will be a big part of it, the planning in your position and your posture and how you should look and the selection and all that, 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 that helps that. And it removes a fear. Um, you model a sense of confidence that they would have seen you when you're more in control. Um, it also diminishes a panic that can ripple effect into players and officials and other people. You're, you're seen as this, this lighthouse, as this, as this guiding light, you can be calm. There was a lovely poem by Derek Mahon that got a lot of purchase during the first lockdown. Uh, everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. And no matter what age group players we're working with, if that's what you emit from your presence on the sideline while you're observing, 
matching to the blueprint of the scenarios and the shape that she had well discussed and practiced already. And they see the sense of calm from you. Now you're really maximizing this wonderful opportunity is there for all of them to perform to their best. So knowing your role is a, it's a little, it's a safety net. It's a, it's a handbrake before you leave the house on a day of a game. Darwin, there's a quote I'm going to, because uh, I can't remember it, I'll just kind of paraphrase it, but Darwin said, it's not the strongest or the fastest that survive. It's those who react best or react quickest to change. Now, ch things change in a game ferociously. If you're obsessed with the fourth official or the referee or the parents or the spectators or whatever else, you're, you're diminishing your own role. And I've been intrigued as a big word, but watching the premiership managers since lockdown, there's no histrionics from them. There's no up and down the sideline. There's no fighting with fourth officials, minimum. They're not have to be boxed into their little area that they have by the sideline. They're far more subdued. And I asked myself why. And really many of this was performance for the fans. Now in these big contexts, it might be to generate some more noise or whatever. But if you have a player who plays best because it's noisy, well, you've got a real challenge on your hands. And uh, now how do you help them play when there's no noise? But I think the behavior of coaches in these contexts is they're beginning to know their role an awful lot better. Maker, mind your own business, accept what is, and know your role. E, enjoy, enjoy. The games are what we start for. We don't really get involved because of training. We love the games, enjoy it. And see it as an opportunity to learn, to really, really learn. Now we'll reveal character. Now we'll see both skills and tactics and the application of it. Really, really enjoy this opportunity because competition, competition is tough. And I was coaching a long time in a good few sports before I really grasped the nettle of sharing with the athletes I was helping. That competition is a struggle. It's tough out, I've mentioned before, there's an opponent there, you're in public, you'll physically get tired. There's a consequence to what you do. But it's also a yardstick to measure improvement. When you get it right in, in, in competition, you know you really got it. When you get it right in training, you know, yeah, 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 it'll be different. Nail it in competition. It really reinforces learning that has happened. So you're not ridding them of the nerves or whatever but you're also giving them this confidence so that they can see clearly, I, I can do this in the white heat of a game. Good wood doesn't grow with ease, the lot, the, good do, wood doesn't grow with breeze. The, here we go again, take three. Good wood doesn't grow with ease. The stronger the breeze, the stronger the trees. My grandfather from Cluny Glasha. Good players don't grow with ease. The more mistakes they make in training and supported and helped by you, the better they'll be eventually. One game, two game, three game, four game, five game, a season of games. Getting out there, expressing themselves, raising their self-awareness, being watched by you, and then having your review and your reflections, your feedback to connect them in training. It's a major powerful source of learning for players if you free them to do that. Let go, let fly, forget. Let them in there and express themselves. The game is also, and this, and I, uh, this idea of enjoying, on the proportion, and I don't know, you'd probably be able to throw some, um, some statistics at me, but I would just, if we throw out a figure, maybe 10 training sessions to every game, even at inter-county during the league there, it's about one, got the championship, one, one game to every five uh, training sessions. So it's a rare opportunity that we need to maximize. And of course, we all like to learn. Now, it's an opportunity for you to learn, to get off your high horse and begin to fulfill your role. It's, begin, it's an opportunity for you to measure the consequences of your training of what you allowed the players do during the session. Sessions in between, did, did, it, did it work? Did it read? That's when you know it works. It's an opportunity to reveal the characters of the players. And so, so welcome it as such as an opportunity to measure progress, not only of players, but of you. How, how are you behaving now? And it allows us falling to this well of kindness that, that sometimes, sometimes okay is good enough. 
we strive to improve in training, we try, strive to improve. And under the pressures of competition, sometimes okay is good enough. I find that the good learn quickly. The good players, the good coaches, the good, they learn quickly. The mediocre learn more slowly and, and may never do so. But to ignore the greatest opportunity there is to learn, wow, wow. The other thing I find about that of using as an opportunity to learn is that winning teams or performers who play well, they may not know why or how they come out on top. It's an intuitive thing that they, they, they do it. Now, the further they go on, um, it's like young kids, they're you know, singing in front of granny, you're not, not, not a bit afraid when they get a bit older, who a little bit different. Ask someone who can sing, really sing, to sing. And they won't give an opportunity of karaoke to someone who can't sing and they're up and you can't take, can't, can't take the mic from them. So the whole context of learning through the game, the winners may not know why or how they came out on top. We need to, we need to learn that, the, what worked well. And of course, in failure, lessons can be learned that success can never deliver. And again, there's a time and a place to, 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 to look at that. So the enjoyment is, is a huge one. And I would enjoy, I would ask coaches to enjoy their cycle of learning, plan, do, review. This is the plans I've made. This is what the players are doing. And now I have an opportunity to help them review. That's not the cycle that players have. It isn't always plan, do, and review. I think the best players, they start with an action. They do. They do. They see the outcome. Wow, that worked. And they're reinforced by it. They may have made a score, a block, a tackle. They may have tracked back or whatever else. But it starts with their doing. They see the outcome of their doing and it's reinforced. So again, we have to maximize the opportunity to let them learn, but let them do it. Let them do it. And of course, some of the great things in sports performance, the Fosbury flop, the double hand, the various gymnastics maneuvers have started not by coaches, but, but, but by players. So the E enjoy the opportunity that the games provide for us to learn. And of course we do start to, we, we get involved in the game to, to learn. Time, okay, I'm, I'm, into, I'm into R. The R is a bit of a hobby horse of mine. The R is for rules. So maker, mind your own business, you'll be busy all the time. A is accept, K is know your uh, role. And E is enjoy and maximize the uh, opportunity. Every game is an opportunity to learn. What are rules? Pat Duffy, sadly deceased now, asked me to write up an introduction to coaching book many years ago in NCTC, as it was called. And he asked me to include something about the rules. And that became the most difficult part for me to fill in. It was only a page at the end of it. But I got searching about what, what rules are. And I saw rules were described as mutual agreements that nobody should break. That's what I put into that that time. Mutual agreements that no one should break. And for a long time, and a very long time, I in my own head saw mutual as two. So the players and the referee. So there was the mutuality of it. But of course, now I see it much broader. The rules are the agreements that no one should break for everyone, for the players, for the officials, for the administrators, for the club, for the region. And because our game is our indigenous game for every single person there, the rules are important. Why are they there? I have a little mnemonic myself from the Latin word fides, faith. One, F, fair play. It's fair to everybody. It's the best way to measure improvement because it's the context within limitations that the rules provide. It gives us a discipline which allows life lessons and everything to be provided. The E is for the enjoyment. We're enjoying because we're within the rules. And the F is safety, fides, fair play, improvement, discipline, enjoyment, and safety. A hobby horse of mine, my God it is. I have seen coaches, coach players to break the rules. I'm horrified by it, horrified. I actually think, high horse again, that the greatest single challenge to coaching is the maintenance of the rules. And why? Because no more than frontline workers are at the front line now in curing a virus. 
coaches are the first arbitrator. They are the first guardian of the rules. So everything you must do in training must be within the rules. And then let's test it, the yardstick to measure improvement within the game. You are that first arbitrator. And the skill is really only the skill within the limitations that is created within the rules. Break the rules of change, wider space, smaller space, more time, less time, more steps, less step. That's the context in which the game is played. And of course, by adhering to rules, we're testing personality. We're letting them go into a context that's on edge, where they are already on high dough. And if you, know, if you go to some place or do something that you shouldn't do, you're nearly on high dough already. So we're getting people to, in a state of high dough, make good decisions. Story at this stage, Brother Willie Morgan had a massive positive uh, influence on me. And the eldest of six, I would have lost temper at home a bit, but when I got into playing basketball games, by God, I, I, lost, I lost my temper a lot. And Brother Morgan asked to see me one day after school and he addressed this issue with me. And he said, Liam, when you lose your temper again, or if you lose, I'm going to take you off. Now, it was quite good. I wasn't used to being taken off. But I did, and he did. And I sat seething on the bench. And in the next game, I didn't lose my temper in training too much. In the next game, I, when I lost my temper, he took me off again. And my reaction was to stop going training, which was very unusual for me. I was seething with them, really. But he didn't come looking for me. Uh, the message dawned on me slowly. Liam, you've got to stop losing your temper. And I asked to see Brother Morgan after school one day, and I told him, look, nothing long. I said, OK, I'm, I, I control my temper. That's 50, 45 years ago. Now, it's, it's very seldom I've lost temper since. I did mention it in the school that I once taught at a, at a prize-giving night, a whole audience of parents dressed to their nines, the kids dressed as their nines. I had taught some of the students before I left. And I told this story about Brother Morgan. I said, I can't remember when I lost my temper last. But from the middle of the audience, Colin, Colin F, I'll call him now. He stood up and said, sir, sir, do you remember? And I remembered and all his class. I lost it. I completely lost it in the field one day. But that was about it, you know, over a long period of time. So what a life lesson in not only the rules of the game. There's moral, legal and ethical rules applied to us in our engagement as coaches. But the rules provide that contact to us in the game. And rules define the way the game should be played. They describe the way the game should be played. And because there are rules there, there are consequences to it. It limits our behavior, just like the legal, moral, and ethical ones. They provide wonderful opportunities um, for life, life lessons. And again, vaccine is one of the words in the vocabulary lot. Now, the black card is really a vaccine to diminish the virus of fouling that has come into the game. Now, we as coaches have a big, big say in this. And our behavior towards other, coach, other players breaking the rules has to be to calm. That's not our job. Mind your own business and you'll be busy all the time. So that concludes my high horse at the moment. In just concluding, again, a thank you. Uh, again, a reminder of the mnemonic. Um, mind your own business, accept what is, know your role, enjoy in every opportunity, another E for that um, uh, to learn, uh, and the rules. And my main aim is that you would plan after this, plan to do one thing differently. Thank you for listening to me and inviting me. And I'll try and answer any questions now you might have. Yeah, so thank you very much, Liam, for a very insightful presentation. If you guys have any uh, present, uh, questions, put them in. But a few questions came in during the webinar uh, while you're presenting, okay. Liam. You don't mind if I put them to you? I think you've kind, of, um, you've kind of answered them uh, in a way. But just to, to, if I were to ask you one word, a quote from the sideline, Give me one word. What should they be on the sideline? Give me one word. What would it be, Liam? I Probably put you on the spot in that one. I wouldn't have any problems. It, it should be calm. Uh, they should ooze a sense of control. I mean, the 
the four C's of mental fitness, you know, um, control, confidence, concentration, and I always forget another one, but that, that, that's what they should ooze. Many times in, in learning about how coaches work, for a time I used to go and get as near to coaches as I, as I could. And I loved going to basketball games. Now I had played a lot up to university, but I loved going and sitting behind coaches and listening even to what they were and, and seeing what they were doing. And sometimes you'd see good practice, but in many, many cases, uh, you'd see bad practice. And William, I, just to add on to that one, I think we as coaches have a duty to coaching, to coaches and to, to sport to behave properly. I think we have a duty to the game and our players, it exceeds. So these people who go ranting and raving up and down the sideline, it's great visuals for people to watch. Oh, look at Lee Morgan, look at him shouting and roaring. The visual of the coach looking calm and controlled isn't. So we're not going to see good examples of coaching on TV because it isn't good TV. But we as coaches have to maximize the opportunity to very much have the opportunity to be calm and controlled. And that's interesting because I suppose a lot of people kind of mentioned here tonight about, you know, if a team is flat, they, they, and, I, and I, I'm going to pose a question to you in a minute. It's a very interesting one that came up there from Paul Creven. But in terms of, you know, if a team is flat and you, know, you want to get hit the ground running, you know, and you're calm, you can't be probably, can you be calm for too long if, you're, if your team is flat? And how do you motivate a team to get back on the horse, as they say, uh, and a game, Liam? So that's, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting okay. one I'm going to throw to you there. Oh, it is. Now, let, let's get in more specifically to your role. Your role before the game is to get them up for the game. I, I, I meant mo motivation is arousal and direction. Yes, now, yes. It, it is your job to, to arouse, to, to get them into this maximum state for, for uh, competition. I was involved with a team that during, if I call it just for the moment, the madness of the loud arousal, two key players were not in the dressing room. They were already ready. This freaked them out and they were out of it. Now, that was a team that was with for a long, long time and you got to know them. The arousal is important and you have opportunities at half time to do that as well. And you'll have to weigh up the situation. Are we in the lead? Are we behind? Are we level? What's, what's happening? But your ability to assimilate information on that, you need a calm head. Yeah. The other thing is direction. That's the other point of motivation. Now, you're not playing. They've got to be the ones able to direct and play. And when we allow players to self-direct and learn how to self-direct, now we've got a team who can think for themselves. And I did see a question there, a James Horn or a Davy Fitz. James <laughs> Horn, I, I think it's seven All-Irelands, five or six All-Irelands he's got his team to. National League winners last year, Connacht champions this year. In Gaelic games, we sometimes are blinded to everything except the winner, the one, the winner the one that gets the cup there's, there's lots of other there's lots of other levels there and Davy's mentioned and I know Davy pretty well a lot of what Davy does is to distract the others it's not about his own team it's to distract to openly open a door will you come in here to this door and take your mind off what it is you do yourself and once you're in there he's gone <laughs> he's gone somewhere else so my ideal to answer the question is I want coaches away from the sidelines so that they can measure and look at and observe and enjoy the product of the preparation that they have put into players in advance. So what, what kind of tip would you give that during the game and it came in there in the question and answers uh, section, you probably can't see it in the chat, is that, okay, right, okay, you, you've, you've tried to arouse them, you've given them that, you're very specific in your feedback and it's not general, it's to the game. And, but then during the game, they're still down. Like, are you going to stay in the sideline and be very calm? Or like, do you let the players sort it out? Okay. Well, or, does that come back to the tra training environment as well, Liam? Do you know that you know yeah. there's going to be a situation in training where like, there is going to be the chaos, things aren't going so well. Do you step in and try and deal with it, or do you step back and let the players try and find the solutions? And if you in, create that environment, will that help with that scenario on the match day? If you create that environment in training, Liam? Yeah. Well, let's say, William, if, if in training you get the players to do what they're told all week. There isn't a hope in hell of them being able to make their own minds about what they do in the game, in, in a game. So it gets back a lot to the coach. Do, do you allow them make mistakes? You know, I would ask a lot of coaches, 
uh, to acknowledge, hands up those who agree that you can, there's, there's opportunities to learn from mistakes. And then when they're off guard a while later, I would ask on a show of hands, hands up the coaches who have made mistakes in the last month, or there's no hand up. Now, likewise with players, they can learn best by mistakes. Now, there is no consequence to making, to really having a mistake in training, but you allow the players fix it there. Kick the ball wide in training, then we all go home. Kick the ball wide in a game, we, we've missed that point. So that context of learning within the game is true and real for that game only. And look, it will be all right. It will be all right. We need to just kind of accept that as, as the coaches. But the profile of the coach going up and down the sideline demeans coaching and it needs to be. It demeans it. It is not effective. And if the players on the pitch need to be aroused by that kind of player, by that kind of performance, you're actually diminishing their potential. There's a whole mindset in their head that you've locked off. And, and everybody, come on to our webinar next Monday night. We're actually doing a webinar on how to Im involve players in the decision-making process and problem-solving process in training, which I think will be very, very applicable to that one there, Liam. Um, thank you very much for that, Liam. Another one, a nervous player. Players are nervous. I suppose it kind of goes back to the importance of just enjoying the occasion and how you come across and cam and being in, in sure that you're enjoying. Do you know what is a day where you can, you know, I suppose, express yourself, try out what you've been learning in training. So a player that's nervous, Liam, and, and, and finding it, you know, difficult to probably you know folks on the game what is that how would you deal with that scenario i was very nervous as a basketballer played a high level at schools and universities not after that i was very nervous as an athlete and i ran for a lot longer and in the latter times of my athletics i i motivated myself by saying this is your last race Liam. you're so nervous just get now the minute the race is over i want to the next one but in helping players now well one i welcome nerves if they're not nervous they're, they're in the wrong place now, it isn't the absence of nerves, it's, it's the control of nerves. And I wrote about that control or what you can do about it in an issue for the, your, your, your magazine there a few years ago. I invite players to draw out where they want to be on the field. I want them to draw out scenarios of positions, even matchstick men of how they should, what their shape should be. And number of ball contacts, aim, number of ball contacts, tackles, scores, blocks, positions, proximity. So you give them a menu or that you invite them to create a menu that they can jump into. But I welcome now the presence of nerves. And I was only watching an interview with Pavarotti there, who I think is dead 10 or 12 years at this stage. But he was saying the torment of being nervous and it didn't leave when he came on the stage, which a lot of others would say he didn't lose the nerves he didn't know if he was going to really hit a note until he hit the note but because he was at that stage of agitation it helped him do it best so i'd welcome the nervousness but i'd welcome the management of the nervousness as well yeah i i see there you know going back to that point about being calm and so i suppose it goes back to how you create scenarios in your in your training whereby you can stimulate and motivate each other that you know the, there's leaders in a team i suppose and that comes back to the point about the, the the leaders and i suppose developing your players in training so that they can make the decisions on the field of play i'll just give you a few more questions uh liam if you don't mind and that are coming back here um i'm just going to pick uh i suppose with 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 that kind of on the sideline and coaching boys and girls, and I understand why you know, and girls and probably you know taking feedback. I suppose that jumping and, and shouting and you know fist pumping on the sideline might might be applicable to the to the to boys. But, but how do you think uh, girls and female players will react to that, um, Liam? You know, do you think they tend to to react to that? And just I'm just thinking of of, of the late, late Eamon Ryan. You know, always told me they're like you know in the All Ireland when they're down a number of points to Dublin. You know, and he said in in, in a presentation that. He didn't have the answers, but the players found the answers. But his calmness in the sideline never got excited. Is it the environment he created uh, achieved that, that there was leaders on the field for him when he didn't yeah. have the answers, he said? Yeah. The whole aim is to, players don't need coaches. Players only need the football. And the aim really should extend to the point that if you were unable to attend the game, no matter how important, that the game will still go ahead and they can make the decisions. Brother Colm O'Connell, um, Corkman from Mallow, uh, Cahar Duggan, who coaches the Kenyans, he, he said in an interview I did with the DCU this month, last year, that 
he doesn't travel to the competitions because they'll never face in competition, he said, something they won't have faced a thousand times in training. Now, a little bit of an exaggeration because the context of comp competition. You mentioned leaders there. I think everyone is a leader. I don't like the idea of identifying a leader because you're also identifying someone who is not the leader. And this idea of expressing their personality, the competition is when it's revealed and it is about the players. It's not about us. We're there just to help them all the time. So I'm strong on the idea of letting players flourish and giving them the opportunity to flourish. Because if they can only do best what it is they're told to do, when you're not there, then, then what happens? Um, and this expression of free moment, of free action, just what excites us in games. We like to see people thinking for themselves and and working within the system. You know. Next, um, just just uh, one or two more there, I suppose. You know, this kind of idea that you know a, a poor decision is made, uh, and you know how do you interact with uh, how do you how do you, I suppose react to mistakes are made? It's very hard, I suppose, on the sidelines. You know when you know you're in a game, whatever situation it is, and referees make poor decisions. You know, and it's how you kind of how do you stop yourself reacting to situations like that, whereby you know a decision may have gone against you, maybe a player reacted. How do you kind of have you any little strategy that would just take you step back and take a breath, or how would you do, Liam, in that situation, just to re? I well, I think a, a red line on what is good behaviour and what's not, William, is a good one. Yeah. I mean, I, I was in a medical clinic this morning. Now, if the nurse came in and shouted my name, hey, Morgan, get in here, you know, I, I'd possibly have been leaving, you know. So there are standards of behaviour that we bring to the sideline that are far, far lower often than we accept anywhere else. But the acceptance of mistakes by others, I think, is a vital part of it. And I don't like a lot of this things like VAR or whatever. I, I would like to see that the referee is right even when they're wrong. They, they have a job to do. They're, they're going to make mistakes. It's none of our business. None of our business. We don't really want a referee on the field who's going to be influenced by us shouting at them. Because if they're going to be influenced by us shouting, they're going to be influenced by the other manager shouting at them. So we, we need to see that the context to the game and to the players who we love we want them. We want them to grow. We want them to flourish. You know? Do you know one that comes here and it's come across a few good few times tonight, Liam. And I just ask you two more questions. This is this the yeah, penultimate yeah. one in terms of the opposition sideline. Do you know the the coach? Mm. They're up and down the sideline. They're roaring. They're shouting. You're trying to be calm. You know, you're trying to be directing your players, but the opposition sideline are roaring, shouting their players. Maybe at times, maybe try to put off your players indirectly. Mm. How do you deal with that scenario, Liam? Or can you control yeah. that? Okay, well, you can't control them, but remember they're doing it partly to distract you and they're partly distra to distract your players. Now, I like the idea that when your players are in flow and they're really going, they, they, they won't see any of this, but this doesn't happen all the time. But it's up to you to make sure that if you now are distracted by them, your ability to assimilate the information in front of you, are your players being distracted by this? Which players are being distracted by this? What is their actions when they're distracted? Do they foul? Are they more likely now to get sent off? And now we've a bigger problem. And that would be something that you note and bring in to, tr to training the next day, like Brother Morgan did it with me. So again, anything that intrudes on your role is something you just back off. You cannot control it. And I know the difficulties of it. And I know when the, when the, when the, the emotions are high. But our role is to make sure that we step beyond that. We, we, we move beyond it. Yeah. Knowing the rules of the game, Liam, do you think that'll help you on the sideline if you know the rules of ladies football and the rules of the actual game and having probably a, a better understanding of the rules of the game in terms of you know the playing rules and stuff? Do you think that helps people on the sideline? Of course, like William, you and I will know in our in, in helping devise the level two course how, how shocked players were when they found out rules for the first time, how shocked coaches were when they found out rules. The game is played within a context, like as a track runner, if I ran 400 meters slightly inside the lane, I was having huge advantages if it was happening. There's a lane there. The lanes are the representation of the rules. And it really saddens me to see the way 
the game, the, the, the men's game more so, but I can see it now too, it's intruding into the ladies' game. The rules are being pushed right to the very edge and coaches, first arbitrator, guilty. Referees, second arbitrator, guilty. Rugby players will pass the ball forward to create space if they were allowed, but they're hammered on it. So they're, they don't do it. So I'm not blaming the referees because I'm talking to coaches. Coaches, you're the frontline workers to make sure that this happens. And the rules define the game. They define the, the type of ball we play with, the size of the arena, three points for a goal, one point for a point. They, they, they decide it. Um, tiny margins. I was watching the snooker over the weekend, the quarterfinal, the great Ronnie O'Sullivan was beaten 6-3. It looked like a fair hiding, but he only missed three shots in pockets, three. One of them was just a, a miss. Now, why is that in rule? The rules are really, really finely tuned. And yet, yet it allows the, it's the only way it allows the game to be played. Yeah, I'm repeating you a wee bit there. Yeah. No, so Liam, look, look, I could talk on. I thank you very much. And I noticed a lot of questions that we probably didn't get to. What we will do is we'll get those questions and we we'll, we we'll answer those questions for you um, over the coming days and get it out to you. But um, Liam, I just want to say thank you very much. If you, if you don't mind me, can you just the maker? What are the? Can you go through the the M A K E R? Yeah. Maker, and I'd be from, asking people to do in their heads, and I'd like people when they finish tonight. Tonight I learned that. Just put that into yeah. their notes. Tonight I learned. Uh, mind your own business. And you'll be busy all the time. The A is accept what is. K, know your role. Be very clear about it. And maybe if I summarize that now to assimilate the things that happen around you. E is to enjoy and to maximize every opportunity that the games provide. And R are the rules. And the rules apply to you too. There's rules about what you can say and do and where you go. Yeah. Liam, thank you very much. And if everybody, before you leave tonight, guys, on the chat function, just put in what's one thing you took from tonight. Just put in there what's thing, one thing you're going to do differently from tonight. Just put in the chat and I'd love to see that and we can read it afterwards. Just one thing that you're going to do differently from listening to Liam tonight. Liam, I found that presentation really, really interesting, really, really engaging. Yeah. And every time I listen to you, I always pick up a few nuggets of information to help us as coaches, even ourselves, you know, on the, on the ground. So uh, thank you very much for your time mm -hmm. and, your, and your effort in putting the presentation together. We had a massive uh, viewing tonight. I think everybody on the call tonight uh, really enjoyed it. Um, so on that note, thank you very much. Everybody, we're back again next week on the 25th. We're looking at involving uh, players in um, decision-making and problem-solving, which is probably a bit in line what Liam was talking about tonight so hopefully that'll help so on that note everyone thank you very much be safe and be well and thank you again thank you very much thank you thank you